The Museum of the History of Polish Jews is the first and only museum to present the 1,000-year history of Polish Jews. Facing the Warsaw Ghetto Monument, the museum completes the memorial complex. The monument honors those who perished by remembering how they died. The museum honors those who perished by remembering how they lived. The museum will be a bridge across time, continents, and people. The museum's mission is to transmit the rich civilization created by Polish Jews to future generations in Poland and the world. At the heart of the museum is its main exhibition, A Journey of a Thousand Years. My name is Barbara kirschenblatt Gimblet, and I am the program director of the core exhibition. It is my pleasure to walk with you through the story. A grand staircase leads from the museum's great hall to another world, a poetic forest, a space of historical imagination filled with the sound of stories that Jews told themselves about how they came to Poland. Jews came east in search of safety. They heard a voice from heaven, Pauline, rest here in Hebrew. This, according to Jewish legend, is how Poland got its name. As we enter the medieval gallery, we cross the threshold between legend and history. We meet the intrepid Jewish travelers who came to this region. The first to mention Poland was Ibrahim Ibn Jakub, a Jew from Cordoba sent by the Caliph on a diplomatic mission across Europe in the 10th century. Jewish merchants traveled along trade routes that passed through Poland. They needed to receive permission from the ruler to settle here, a privilegium or charter, which gave them the right to practice their religion, organize their own community, and engage in various occupations. The other major power was, of course, the church. And in the centuries that followed, each ruler renewed the privilegium, which protected the rights of Jewish communities. As the situation in the rest of Europe worsened, Jews began coming to Poland in greater numbers. During the 13th century, they settled in towns planned according to German town law. By around 1500, Poland was becoming the center of the Ashkenazi Jewish world. Jews were now living in about 100 places, with Jewish communities in about half of them. Paradisus Judeorum, a beautiful scale model of Krakow in nearby Kazimierz, symbolizes the rise of Jewish civilization in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Commonwealth was exceptionally diverse. This territory was home to many peoples, religions, and languages. Religious dialogue and debate were the order of the day, but religious tolerance had its limits. There were also false accusations against Jews. This was a time and place of Jewish learning. From Moses to Moses, there is no greater than Moses. These are the words of praise for the great Polish rabbi, Moses Isserles, known as the Remu. It was here that Hebrew and Yiddish printing flourished. This was also a time and a place of exceptional Jewish communal autonomy. Jewish communities governed themselves not only at the local level, the Kehillah, but also at regional and state levels, most famously, the Council of the Four Lands. And as they had from their very first arrival in Polish lands, Jews played a vital role in the economy, they leased and managed many assets for the nobility on their rural estates and vast latifundia. But there were also many tensions in the system. 1648, the Chmielnitsky Uprising. The pogroms that took place during the Cossack Uprising were so brutal, they've etched themselves forever in Jewish memory. The Commonwealth quickly rebounded from a century of war, and Jewish communities renewed themselves. We enter the Jewish town, a place where Jews made up 30% or even more of the population. They engaged in a much wider range of occupations than ever before and played an important role in the alcohol industry. This was also a period of spiritual yearning, as seen in the home, where we can explore the inner lives of women. There were special prayers in Yiddish for women known as trinis. Women played an important role not only in raising a family, but also in economic life. No town would be complete without a church, the setting for exploring the changing relationship of the church to the Jews. A centerpiece of this gallery is the beautiful painted wooden synagogue inspired by the one that once stood in Gwazdziec near Lviv. This synagogue, like many other aspects of Jewish civilization in the Commonwealth, is an expression of shared artistic traditions and uniquely Jewish meaning. During the 18th century, three new spiritual trends emerge. The Vilna Goan and modern Torah study. 
the Baal Shem Tov and Hasidism. He would be celebrated as the founder of this movement. And Mendel Leffen, who represents the Jewish Enlightenment. In 1772, the Commonwealth is under attack. The Austrian, Prussian, and Russian empires begin to partition the Commonwealth. Each takes a piece of the royal cake, and for about 140 years, Jews of the Commonwealth will live under these three empires. What will happen to them? Can they become full citizens? This is the debate. How will all the new laws and regulations shape their everyday life? Their clothing, language, marriage age, education, conscription into the army. The changes were dramatic. How did Jews respond? Supporters of the Jewish Enlightenment tried to reform Jewish life through education and the promotion of modern Hebrew. Students of the Vilna Goen created the modern yeshiva and promoted the study of Torah for its own sake. Hasidism expanded rapidly throughout the region and the world thanks to the broad appeal and charisma of its leaders. The train station launches the story of industrialization, urbanization, and rapid change. Jews and others are moving from small towns to big cities in search of work. Lodge rose almost overnight from a village to an industrial center, thanks to textile entrepreneurs, Israel Poznansky among them. What happened to Jews in the three empires? The historian Heinrich Gretz in the Prussian partition, or Sheen Unsky in the Russian partition, or Maritzi Gottlieb in Galicia. Some Jews identified with Polish national struggle and thought of themselves as Poles of the Mosaic faith. They created the Tlumatsky Synagogue, which opened in 1872. They were proudly Jewish and proudly Polish. A wave of pogroms broke out in the 1880s, and new forms of modern anti-Semitism arose. Jews responded to the challenges of modernity in various ways. Modern political movements emerged. Modern Hebrew and Yiddish literature, theater, and press found a mass following. And about a third of the Jewish population emigrated between the 1880s and World War I. This was a time of revolution and war. World War I, the empires collapse, the Second Polish Republic forms, Jews enter this period with a mixture of hope, marked by elections, and fear, marked by pogroms. A lively street is a setting for what some historians have called a second golden age. There are many Jewish political parties, the Zionists, the Agudis Yisroel, the religious party, the Bund, the Jewish labor movement, an historical timeline runs along the politics story, marking the most important events of the period and how Jews responded to them. Cultural life flourished. Vilna, the spiritual capital of Yiddish culture. Klamatsky 13, the Warsaw headquarters of Yiddish writers, editors, and publishers. The press for every interest in Yiddish, in Polish, and in Hebrew. Theater, film, music not only for Jewish audiences, but also for the Polish public. In Café Zimiańska, we meet such individuals as Julian Tuwim and Antoni Słonimski, who contributed so much to Polish culture. Other artists wrote in Polish for Jewish readers in such newspapers as Das Przegląd. We pass through an art salon featuring Jewish artists, and we walk up a stairs to a mezzanine dedicated to everyday life across the length and breadth of the Second Polish Republic, from Gdynia, the newest and one of the smallest Jewish communities, to Drohobich, home of Bruno Schulz, Bobova, a Hasidic town, Kazimierz Dolna and Katowice, Struchin and Novogrudek. Growing up in the interwar years was a generational experience. There were Jewish schools in Yiddish, Polish, and Hebrew, new forms of child rearing and pedagogy. Jewish youth belonged to youth groups and loved sports. This was a generation that looked to the future with a mixture of hope and uncertainty. September 1, 1939, the Germans invade Poland. World War II begins. Poland is occupied by two powers, Germany and the Soviet Union. The separation and isolation of Jews culminates with the closing of ghettos. 
Adam Chernyakov is head of the Warsaw Ghetto Judenrat. Emanuel Ringelblum heads the underground archive that secretly preserves a record of the struggle of Jews to live in the shadow of death, spiritual resistance, struggle to feed families, and the Jewish underground. Stairs lead to a bridge, like the one that joined two parts of the Warsaw Ghetto. From the bridge, Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto saw what they imagined as apparently normal life on the Aryan side. Past the bridge is a scene of Chernyakov refusing to sign the order to resettle Jews, which meant to deport Jews to their death. He committed suicide. Jews were rounded up street by street by street. They were brought to the Umschlagplatz, boarded onto trains, and taken to their death in Treblinka, about 300,000 in all. The few Jews who were left found themselves in a smaller ghetto, now a labor camp. The Jewish underground organized the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Photographs in the strip report document how the Germans suppressed the uprising. They blew up the Tlamatsky synagogue, they rounded up the remaining Jews, took them to the Umschlagplatz, and deported them to their death. We enter the Aryan street, the world of occupied Poland under German terror. Some Jews who survived the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising joined the Warsaw Uprising. How did those living in Poland respond to the Jewish plight? What did they see? What did they think? What did they do? Were they indifferent, hostile, compassionate? Zygota and the Jewish National Committee organized efforts to help Jews. Some Jews hid in the light with Aryan papers, others hid in the dark with the help of individual Poles. Most of them did not survive, and in some cases, those who helped them were also murdered. The Barbarossa Campaign. Germany invades Soviet-occupied Poland. Local pogroms break out in Yedwabne, Lwów, and other locations. Mobile killing squads begin the mass extermination, direct murder, death by bullets. In January 1942 in Wannsee, plans are made for carrying out the mass extermination as efficiently and quickly as possible. Jews from all over Poland and all over Europe are deported to the German death camps in occupied Poland. Chelno, Belzec, Sobibor, Majdanek, Treblinka, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Nineteen forty-five, the war ends. Jews return to a devastated landscape. Of the three million three hundred thousand Jews living in Poland in 1939, only about three hundred thousand have survived. They return from concentration camps, hiding in the Soviet Union. They look for each other. They immediately begin to memorialize the genocide. The monument to the Warsaw Ghetto fighters is unveiled on the rubble of the ghetto in 1948. This is also a period of local violence, and not only in Kielce. Emigration panic follows. Those still in Poland, whether they plan to stay or leave, rebuild their lives. New Jewish communities are established in Lower Silesia. But in 1949, with the onset of Stalinism, the pluralism of Jewish life ends. Jewish life is now confined to one organization, Tez Kajet, and one Jewish space, the club. And Jewish culture is to be national in form, socialist in content. The shifting tide of immigration policy takes a turn with the anti-Semitic campaign of 1968. After about 15,000 Jews leave, very few Jews are left in Poland. There's a profound feeling of absence, the feeling that the story is over, that there will never again be a Jewish world in Poland. The opposition arises and there are small signs of Jewish renewal. 1989, the fall of communism, there's a revival of Jewish life on a small scale, but enormous Jewish presence in Polish consciousness. This is the story that the Museum of the History of Polish Jews tells, a story of life 